All right, everybody. I'll just wait for you to start coming in. We're going to be starting in just a couple of minutes here. So, so far so good. Looks like we're actually being able to start on time this time. I see there's a couple of people coming in. And if you can hear me, just drop a message in there under the messages. And uh, we'll be going live in just a couple of minutes. Well, hello. Looks like our first comment there from MibPro3030. So far, so good. Looks like we're actually being able to start on time this time. I'll mute my other computer. All right. This is great. All right, 31 people, 38 people. Everyone's coming in. Hey, from Houston, Betty. Hey, Ray. Neville. From Australia. Good to see you. Glad you can hear me. Vermont. Hey, Suzanne. From Vermont. Kansas City, Joe. John, Cincinnati, Monica, Buenos Aires, Argentina, hey Jesse, hey Andy, from UK, Lockdown UK, yep, I'm in Lockdown California right now, so from one lockdown person to another, I hope you're doing well, uh, David, good to see you, alright, good to see you again, should I say, Tracy from Oklahoma, yo, Good afternoon, Wilbur. And uh, George. Hey, good to see you, George. Graphic Vincent Van Zeeland. Hey, I remember you from last week. That's a very good Dutch name right there. Denmark. Um, we've got Linwood. We've got New Zealand. Whereabouts in New Zealand are you from, Stuart? Media guy from Canada. Houston. We've got Toronto, Holland, Bulgaria. West Virginia, anyone here not locked down? Good question. Um, Colorado, Turkey. All right, and they just keep coming in. Alejandro, Washington State, Oakview, Canada, United Kingdom. Ready. All right, Larry, I'm ready too. All right, so Greece, Colorado. All right. So where are we looking at here? It looks like we've got more people coming in. I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes because people are still coming in pretty quickly right now. So, uh, hey, Terry from Florida. Thank you, Vincent, for the kind words. Germany. Good to see Germany here. It's pretty late over there in Germany right now, isn't it? Um, so I tried to find a time that would be uh, Pukakoi. Awesome. Awesome, Stuart. In Sweden. I love Sweden. Where are you from in Sweden? I've been to Stockholm and Uppsala over there. Um, where are we going here? Still people coming in pretty quickly. Um, as soon as that people coming in thing slows down, <laughs> we'll start. Uh, Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas, Damien. All right, so it's 101, so we will get started pretty soon. And we've got Central New York. Things are pretty rough there in New York City right now. So how many of you there are from Photoshop Cafe? That you got this message from the newsletter. And how many of you got this message from um, notifications on YouTube? I'd love to know. Gothenburg. Ah, great spot. Palo Alto. So hopefully the stream is good. I've got fast internet. I've got fast up upload. So if it does lag, it's just because right now the whole internet is suffering lag. I'm sure you've probably noticed that. Just the pipes are absolutely full with everybody being stuck at home. And uh, the internet's getting a lot more usage than normal. And also, you know, kids doing school and everything like that. Streaming Netflix and all the, all the good stuff. Newsletter. Great. Notification, all right, notification squad there, Ray. And uh, newsletter, Dubai, good spot. I haven't been there yet, though. All right. So we're 
mostly oh, about half and half right now newsletter and uh, and YouTube all right so it looks like those uh, views are still going up we're at 77 79 I think last week we hit like 120 130 so 81 so you know what we're it's still increasing pretty quickly but why don't we get started I've got a couple of things for you this week a um, couple of tutorials and also um, just a couple of tips so I'm gonna try to maybe make it as long as last week the nice thing is we were able to you know we're not starting 20 minutes late this time which is which is fantastic um, just drop a comment in there and let me know too what you think about the timing because I think last week we went for about an hour um, if you guys feel that's a little long and you think maybe 30 minutes would be better, why don't you let me know what you prefer. If you prefer 30 minutes or you prefer an hour, uh, let me know in those comments there. Because I, I don't want to be <laughs> wearing out my welcome, but I also want to make sure it's worth your while uh, to dial in here. So, so we'll do that. And also, you know, if you've got any questions, get some of your questions queued up. and Because uh, I'll be happy to do some questions and answers. So what I'll do right now is I'm going to kick off with a tutorial. Oh, we're at 95 viewers right now, so we'll be hitting 100 pretty soon here. Um, I was kind of thinking 100 was a good launching point. Um, so we will do a tutorial right now, and then I'll stop for a couple of questions and answers if you guys have got them. And if you don't have any questions and answers, you know, we'll jump in, we'll do a tip, and then we'll jump into the second tutorial, and then we'll wrap up with Q&A and, and maybe another tip. Um, I don't have anything to sell you, so <laughs> don't worry, I won't be pitching anything or trying to sell anything because I really just want to come together right now as a community. Three hours long is good. I like your optimism there, Andy. Sandra likes 30 minutes. Uh, we never too long. From uh, Jesse and Ty says an hour. All right, so we'll have a look at that. And um, 445 EST start would be nice. Okay. All right, so we'll just look at that, and uh, and I'll go through those later. And <laughs> every day, Suzanne, I, I like, I also like your optimism. All right, so I'll look at that in a little bit because I know it's a little delayed sometimes for those uh, comments to come in. So why don't we start with something here? This is a pretty, you know, bad photo. There's a lot of things wrong with it, but I just want to kind of show you guys how to use the eyedroppers inside of Photoshop to quickly um, edit and adjust photos. So this is something I used to do a lot, like uh, back in the day when I actually started working in Photoshop, I was doing print design, worked for a magazine, and I used to do hundreds of images. And what I would do is use this very technique I'm about to show you, because it's just so quick and uh, reliable. So this is actually shot, I shot this in, in Hong Kong um, a number of years ago, and I actually shot this with film. So this will work obviously for film or digital, but what it's going to do is it's going to set your contrast and also it's going to set your white balance um, pretty much really easy just in one move. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to Photoshop. I'm just going to hit the D key just to reset foreground background colors. And just to be good, I'm going to right click on the tools up here and choose reset all tools. I don't know if you guys do that very often, but sometimes, you know, you change a setting in your tools. And you don't put it back where it was and then things don't work and of course you blame photoshop i do you know photoshop's wrong but i realize most of the time if photoshop's not performing right it's yes yeah, sometimes it is photoshop but a lot of the time it's me i've got the wrong preference or something like that so i kind of follow a rule kind of like what you would do in a workshop a rule that a lot of people have in a workshop is if you take a tool out you put it back exactly where you found it and then that way when you need it it's always going to be there. So I tend to do that. If I go into Photoshop and I change the default setting, if it's not a setting I'm going to use all the time, sometimes I'll change the default setting because I prefer a different setting. If that's the case, I'll leave it at that. But if I go to a setting that I'm not going to use very often, what I generally do is when I've finished is I'll put that tool back to its default setting. So next time I go to use it, it's not going to be doing things unexpected. And if you get into that habit, um, that'll save you a little trouble. My voice is clipping a little. Okay, let me drop the volume down a little bit here. Okay, how's that? Is that volume better right now? I'm speaking a little bit louder, just uh, but we'll see how that goes. Let's get the chat off to the side here so I can see the chat. So I apologize if the voice was bad. I definitely want to make sure that's as good as we can get it. 
So how's that sounding? Uh, there, Hans. Uh, he's just talking now, Mark. Okay, so yeah, it's all right, Mark. You haven't missed anything yet. Um, do you hear anything, though? Hopefully you guys hear the sound. Just let me know just quickly before I continue. Is the sound good, and is it sound better? It looks like we just passed 100 viewers, by the way. Um, you guys hear it? Let me know in the comments. As soon as I hear that, I'm going to move forward. And I'll type it in there. Now I'm hard to hear. It's cleaner, but hard to hear. Okay, let me move the microphone a little bit closer. If I'm hard to hear, turn up your volume. I'm joking. <laughs> All right, so it's cleaner. Let me see if I can find a nice compromise there, though, so I'm not too soft. I'll go, I'll go in between. All right, so right now it shouldn't be clipping. Let me take it up. There we go. How's that? That should be as loud as I can get it before it starts to clip. So if everybody's good with that, yep, cleaner, sounds good. Great. Perfect. All right, let's go ahead with our steps. So what we want to do is we're going to use our eyedropper tools, and these can be found under levels or under curves. Now, obviously, the best place to go here is under adjustment layers. And if we go under adjustment layers, let me show you. If we decide to use levels, you'll see under our level setting, there's our eyedroppers. There's the black point, the white point, and then our gray point. If you prefer to, let me get rid of this, if you prefer to use curves, I'll show you where they are under curves. So we're clicking on our curves adjustment layer there, and you can see black, gray, and white. So I wonder if you guys have ever used those. <laughs> uh, I know some people have and some people haven't, but let me show you how we're going to use those right now. But what I'm going to do is just to make it even simpler, let me get rid of that. I'm just going to apply it directly to a, why don't we do a curves adjustment? So I'm going to hit the Command M or Control M to bring up curves. Now the reason I'm bringing up the curves here is just it's a, it works exactly the same as it does in the adjustment layer. Just I can get a little bigger curve here, so it makes it a little easier for you guys to see. Now this is exactly the same settings as the adjustment layer, and I would recommend always doing it on an adjustment layer. And um, because I'm not going to do that, why don't I just copy this? I'm just making a copy of that right now, just so I can show you a before and after. So remember, Control M or Command M for curves. Of course, you'll be doing an adjustment layer. I want it nice and big so everyone can see. If we look on the histogram, why don't we talk about this just a little bit? Uh, the histogram, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the histogram, but what you're really looking for is gaps at the left side and gaps at the right side. So the histogram here, notice there's a slider, this is black, and look at that gray tone on there. That gray tone represents those values in an image. So if you look here, where we see these mountains means there's pixels. So the majority of our pixels are here, and that's our three-quarter brightness area. So this is our mid-tone. Here's our three-quarters brights and whites at the end. Three-quarters shadows here and blacks at that end. And you can tell by just looking at that bar underneath. So when you have this gap here, that means there's not really much happening in the pure whites, which is why this is looking like a dirty window. So it needs to be cleaned, and that's because we're missing the whites. But also, if you look, there's no body in here, and that's because we're missing the foundation, because if you look, there's no pixels in the blacks. So this is a histogram representing low contrast. So what we want to do is we want to increase the contrast. Now, generally speaking, I would just say, well, you know, just go in here, drop it down and then increase the contrast, create an S curve, but we're not going to do it that way. I'm going to hit the Alt key or the Option key and watch the cancel will now set, change to a reset. Click there, that's how you reset any dialog box, Alt or Option key. But what we want to do is we're going to use these eyedroppers. So the first one we're going to go in here is we're going to go in here and we're going to use our black eyedropper. So I'm going to click on my black eyedropper. But what I want to do before I do that is I want to set these eyedroppers. So if I go in here and I double click on that black eyedropper, it's going to bring up a color picker. And what this enables me to do is to give it a little bit of headroom. If you look in here, we say HSB, 
which is hue, saturation, and brightness. Brightness is zero is black, 100 is white, because we're dealing with light. All right, so what we want to do is give ourselves a 5% overhead. So we're going to put 5%. So that means that when we sample that, instead of going to pure black now, it's going to go to 95%. It's going to give us that little bit of overhead so we're not clipping. You can see that. Click OK. Now we're going to double click on the white. We're going to do the same thing. Under the brightness, change it to 95. See how it's not pure white now? It's just got a little bit of gray in there. This enables us to preserve a little bit of detail. Okay, now we've set those eyedroppers. Now the thing is, you don't ever have to do that again. Because that's going to be set and it's going to remember that unless you reset your preferences inside of Photoshop. So now we're going to go to our shadow and what we're doing is we're looking for the darkest point inside of this image. So when we click with this black eyedropper, it's going to set whatever we click on is going to be set to black. Anything darker than that obviously is going to be clipped, but hopefully we can find the darkest part of the image. So what we want to do is if I hold down the Alt or the Option key, see this little black slider there? As I slide up, it shows the darkest point. This is how I find it. So rather than guessing, notice as we go over the pic, over the histogram, we can see, as long as I hold down that Alt or Option key, it gives me a clipping view, and I can see that the darkest portion is in there. So obviously I want to put that back. And so I'm going to take that black eyedropper and I'm going to go in here and I'm going to click on that darkest point and that set that to black. Now same thing with the whites. If we go in here and we hold down the Alt or the Option key and we pull across, we can see where it starts to clip first and I can see the lightest point of that image is right there. So if I choose the white eyedropper, notice see how that histogram clipped it there? We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to go to that brightest part, and when we click on it, boom, that's going to set that now to the brightest part. And if you look up here, you can see how it's been set in the individual color channels. So not only is this just setting the black and white point, it's doing it on each color channel. Now, this will do a lot to bring back the contrast inside of your images. And, uh, and you can see how quick it was to do that. And also, it, it kind of sets the white balance, but we can go further than that. We can set the white balance ourselves if we need it. This is actually pretty good. But if we go and we grab our gray slider, this is not a mid-tone slider, uh, eyedropper, sorry. It's not a mid-tone eyedropper. What it is, it's a gray point. So what we're going to do is go over here and we're looking in the image. And we're going to look for an area that should be neutral gray. So when I click on this, it's going to set that to neutral 18% uh, gray, which is going to be, well, actually not even percentages. It's actually just going to be a gray, gray tone. And then all the colors are going to shift around it. So if I click here and I say, hey, you know what? This should be gray. And I click there. See how it sets that. But if I go to different points, like if we click in the sky and I say, hey, I want that to be gray. See how it throws off the other colors. Or if I click here and I say this should be gray, see how it throws it off. So you're looking for an area that should be a neutral gray, which would be right in there. And click on there and boom, we've got it. So if we wanted to look at this, we could see before and after. You can see how easy it is for us to uh, make those adjustments. So let me just hit cancel right now and I'll show you how fast it would be to do this in real life. And uh, I, uh, my samples were set to point. That's a good point that somebody brought up there. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, now, you can set your sampler by clicking on your eyedropper here, the eyedropper tool. And this is where you get to set the settings for it. And yes, you are right. 3x3, three 5x5, three, five five, 11 by 11 and 5x5 five five is usually what I use as well. Thank you for bringing that up. So what does that do? Well. If you go in here and you choose point sample, it's sampling the individual pixel, which means if there's any grain or any noise in there, you're going to be picking up that individual pixel. In fact, let me zoom all the way in here. So if we zoom into this, this is what is going to be selecting just that one pixel. And then you get a little bit of noise or something in here and you click there, you might not get an accurate sample. 
So if you go to a five by five, then it's sampling one, two, three, four, five. It's sampling this section here. So if I click in the middle, it samples the five surrounding pixels each way. And that gives us a more, um, well, it actually selects 25 pixels in that little block there. And that gives us a little bit um, more of an averaging in the color or the sample. So um, any tool that uses the eyedropper, by the way, you choose your sampling size from up there. Great. All right, so let's go and we're going to just, I'm going to show you how quick and easy it is to work in this method normally. So now that we've done it, you know, we go in here and then we're just going to go into levels or curves. So I grab the curves and I would just generally speaking, alter option, click and drag in here. I see there's my darkest point. I grab my black eyedropper, go in there, click, alt or option, find my brightest point, grab that point there, boom, there, grab the midtone, find a medium gray, click, and boom, I'm done that quick. So that's usually how I would do it. Now, if this feels a little bit strong, you can always, you know, because we're using the adjustment layer, you can roll it back if you want. All right, so that was essentially that. Um, so what else have we got here? Any questions about any of this? Um, okay, so we're, we're pretty good there. All right, so one of the tips I was going to do was to show the uh, sample settings, <laughs> which we just did. And uh, thank you, Tracy, for that prompt. Um, let me show you just another quick tip before we jump into the next tutorial. So I'm going to show you, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Let me create a new layer here. We're working with the line tool. So if we go down here and we grab our line tool, there's three different options. And any of these shape or vector layers have that shape path or pixel. So if you wanted to create a shape, this will create basically the same as a custom shape. So when we go into our, you know, custom shapes like this, you know, that is a shape. And that means we can do things like change the colors, you know, we can do different things like that. So it's a vector shape. The second option is a path. And I'm just going to use this particular pattern right now to show you then we'll go to our line a path here just creates those paths so we can go into the paths panel here and we can work with those shape is kind of similar to a path except the shape is filled and a path is not and why might you want to do a path well maybe you want to put a brush on it like uh, for example I've got that and I want to create uh, some kind of an effect let's go down here um, why don't I open up my options here in the brush. I'll increase the spacing here just to kind of show you what we could do. By the way, quick and easy way to make dotted lines. Let's do that, increase that spacing. And maybe I want to use a red color just so you guys can see it. And then if I go down into my paths panel, you know, I can do things here like, you know, I can stroke the path, for example. Um, let me find the right one for that. Am I on the right layer? Let's have a look. Create a layer. There we go. Work path there. Stroke that path. Click there. And then what it does is it takes that brush and applies that brush to that path. And I can hide it. So that's, you know, basically something you could do with the path. And then the third option is pixels. So if we choose pixels, it just creates a pixel layer, you know, just like what you're used to working in inside of Photoshop. Okay, so why would I want to, you know, do the different options? Well, it depends what you want to do, right? So this is what I want to show you here, though. I'm going to create a new layer, and then I'm going to grab the line tool. Now, the line tool obviously is a great way of creating lines. You hold the shift key, it'll constrain it to 45 degree angles. So you can easily, you know, do things like this. Very quick and easy to do that, that kind of stuff. But also in here, there's the option to add arrowheads. In fact, why don't I just fill this with white and create a new layer quickly? Here we go. And this will make it a little easier to see. So we can do things like arrowheads. If we click up the top here, 
we can put an arrow here at the start and the end. So why don't we do a start and an end and increase the weight of this to say a six pixel and notice here we do that we can apply these arrowheads. Now if you want to save these and have the different options go up under here under the tool preset and right now we can click plus and we'll call it double and now we've got a double arrow there. Now if we go up under a different tool set look at that we just got a single arrow if we want to go back to it choose that double arrow make sure we're on that pixel layer and we're back using that double arrow now of course if we drop the weight down to one pixel it's going to have a smaller arrowhead now we can go in here and we can change all of this you can change the thickness you can change the uh, start and end and you can change the arrows you can make a thicker arrow or you can make it a little concave see how that's just kind of flat if I do like a 30% right now notice now that arrow is a little bit indented in fact why don't we take this to 100 so you guys can see it there we go and we'll go a little bit bigger let's make this document bigger by the way you can crop bigger and let's take that arrow now if I do it see how we've changed that arrow to have um, you know more concave so those are kind of nice things that you can do or we could do just the start only and you can go into here save that preset as start and then why don't I create another preset where I have no arrows or no arrow head let's create that preset none so now that means whenever I'm working and I, I want to have nothing I just paint there's a line if I want to go up and I do a double arrow I can grab it there if I want to go up and grab a arrow just in the start I can do it here and notice also those savings for concave or flat are also saved under the tool preset so once you create these uh, tool presets it's really quick and easy to go in and use arrows so if you've guys watched my tutorials on Photoshop cafe or um, or even read my books you'll see that I use arrows a lot and this is exactly how I create my arrows here inside of Photoshop and I use those all the time all right so it looks like we might have some questions here um, so we have if you want the exposure control if I just want the exposure control without the individual RGB curves um, oh you mean for using the eyedroppers um, can you use some, and I'm just going to look at these questions, can you use something like an x-ray card, would the white black point work? Okay, so we've got some, some good questions there. Um, okay, so say I'm going in here, let's go back to that. And I'm going to go in here, if I just wanted to set those white and black points, let's go in here, levels. And I just grab the black point and I'm using levels right now. I could go in and just, I know where the black points are. I could click that black point there. I could click the white point here. And then let's have a look and see what this is doing with the individual. Yeah, see what it's doing is I can go in here and now I can just move this to the beginning and the end of the histogram if I want. See what I'm doing? I'm going through each one of these individually and in blue so what it's doing is it's trying to anticipate the darkest and the lightest points um, and that's what it's essentially is doing there so I could go like that and then manually go in and adjust those and then grab the gray slider and then just click on my gray point once again but I believe once I click on a gray point it's probably gonna move these let's have a look mm, no it doesn't so Okay, so that's how you could go into the individual colors and kind of set it that way. I don't know if that's what you were asking. Um, uh, Subic, is that how we say it? But that's how we could do it. And Alejandro, yes, absolutely, you use an X-ray card. Um, and I do that a lot. So when I'm working, um, in particular if I'm doing something like I'm shooting a model or I'm in a uh, situation like that, you know, where I'm... Uh, in a studio setting and everything's controlled lighting or whatever I will put the x-ray card 
or even just a 18% gray card into one of the shots, then I'll use these to, you know, capture that. And then once I've done it, I can go in here and I can save a preset and see what I've done there as I've just created that. And I could, that's a levels or curves. And I could do that, you know, I could do session one, call it. Okay, so now I've saved that preset. And then every other image that I want to apply from there, I can go in there and I can apply that preset curve there. And then that's going to color adjust all the shots. So I'll get the gray card in one shot or the X-ray uh, color checker in one of the shots. And then uh, save that preset and then just batch process it. And that's a very quick way of doing it. And of course, you can also do that inside of Camera Raw if you want to batch process it that way. You can do that. You can save your presets and stuff in there as well. So that's uh, kind of how I would do that. Um, that's a great question. Um, I wish I had the, um, if I had a, I, have, I do have a webcam. Um, <laughs> Maybe next week I'll, we'll try and drop it in. I've just been very um, reluctant to try and do that because I've had, you know, connectivity problems. So I tell you what, why don't, why don't I try it? It's probably a bad idea, but um, let me go over here. I'm going to try this. If it goes terribly wrong, I apologize. Let's see what happens if I try to turn on the video capture device. Is it going to get me? Mm, no, doesn't look like it's going to work. Okay, we're not going to mess with that right now. Um, so maybe as we go on, I'll start to add live cameras and things like that. We'll get more sophisticated. This time, I just wanted to get the thing going as far as the web um, web goes. Um, and about bending the arrow, um, you're not really going to bend the arrow like that inside of uh, you know using the line tool. If you wanted to create that, you would have to either bend it or you would have to go in and use a, a path and create a path and uh, and do it that way. Um, there are, however, you, under the custom shapes here, there are some arrows. Let me show you. If you go under his shapes here, and if you don't have it, just turn on your legacy, which I've got here. So you could actually just restore that. And let's look at the default shapes. Under arrows, we have some bent and curved arrows here that come with the uh, some of the legacy shapes and stuff like that. So you could could kind of use those. So let's go and select that. There we go. And you could draw with those. And obviously, I'm an adjustment layer, so it's not going to show. So that you could kind of do it that way, but as far as uh, doing it, you would have to, you know, just use curves and create those shapes, and then you would have to just kind of grab the arrowheads because I don't believe we can add those from the pops inside of Photoshop. Or you could go into Illustrator, create them, and bring them in. So uh, that's that's basically what you get there. All right. Oh. Okay. So. Rich, Rich can help me out with my video camera. Awesome. You you are the man. All right, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to do something else. I'm going to jump into another tutorial, and I'm going to show you just a kind of a fun thing I did. Um, let's have a look here. Do I have it there? I probably don't want to go into all of that. So I've got it in Lightroom here, and I created this. It was a, a tribute for Kenny Rogers, you know, who passed away last week. And um, so, you know, I was thinking about the gambler and of course, you know, the emphasis here is bringing the emphasis on the king of hearts. And, you know, it's of course also, you know, it's a, it's a royal flush. So what I did is I shot these pictures here and, um, and I have a little light I got from Aperture. It's a little um, fun, fun little light. It's a very small portable light and, uh, you know, and, I don't know if you guys have ever worked with those little portable lights. They're a lot of fun. But anyway, it's called an MX. I actually won it on a Twitter contest, believe it or not. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I tried some different shots here, and I'm using a macro. So I'm shooting with a Sony a7 III, and I'm trying to get the focus. So eventually I got this focus here, so I tried some different ones. I'm focusing here with a 90 millimeter macro, 
I was able to get this at uh, 2.8. I was able to get it where the uh, kingdom is nice and focused, and these other parts are kind of falling out of focus a little bit. And then I made some basic adjustments here inside the develop module. And you can see all I did is I just really kind of cleaned it up. But let me reset this, and I'll show you the workflow going here from working in Lightroom. This is Lightroom Classic, and then going into Photoshop, you know, where we're going to get all the textures and the grunginess. So essentially what I did is I recovered the highlights. I pulled that all the way up, and then I opened up the shadows a little bit. And what this is doing is just bringing out the detail. Notice there's a lot of texture on these cards. They're nice new cards. But once I set this, I realized I want to get a little brighter with the whites. And let's not do anything with the blacks right now. So what I'm going to do is play around with the exposure now until I get that exposure how I like it. It looks pretty good, but it's too bright there. So I'm going to take the highlights back a little bit. Now, one of the things i got to watch for when working with these highlights is that these whites don't become milky. See, like now they're just kind of a little bit milky. And you can kind of counteract for that by pushing the whites. Now, if you look up here, this region here is our highlights region. This is our whites region right there. Well, actually, the other way around. This is our whites, and this is our highlights. So you can actually, I don't know if you guys were aware, you can actually click and drag in here. If you look on there, as you move across, see how it goes into the different regions. So it's exposure, shadows, blacks, highlights, whites. So you can actually click in the histogram too if you want. See what I'm doing? By making those adjustments that way. So you can go, oh, but I lost that white. So you can go into the whites and bring back that nice clean white while bringing back uh, detail there. So I'm not sure if you guys were aware that you could do that inside of Lightroom. But anyway, um, let's keep going. And uh, Kenny Rogers was into golf at that time. Interesting. Uh, another thing I don't know if you guys knew that um, Kenny Rogers was also a photographer. Um, and I was actually at PPA a couple of years ago, and he was supposed to be doing a keynote there. And unfortunately, um, he had to cancel at the last minute, so it kind of was a bit of un unfortunate. But anyway, um, so let's have a look here. And that's awesome that you got to, uh, got to interview him. That's awesome. All right, so what we're doing is just making those adjustments. But now I really wanted to bring the emphasis on the king. So what I can do is go in here and use the radial tool. And so I'm going to just create a circle around the king here. And then what I'm going to do is take the exposure down a little bit and see how it's darkening the rest of the photo. Now, I'm just going to drag this out because I want to make it a little bit bigger. And maybe give it a little bit of an angle. So we're going to push it there, go to the edge, and now we can rotate that. See that? But I'm going to rotate it more around the king. There we go. Looks good, and of course, if you want to make it bigger, just click and drag. There we go. All right, so I'm going to take the uh, highlights down more. So it's going to start to darken those highlights and the exposure. And what I'm going to do, too, is I'm going to make them a little bit cooler. So the shadows are starting to get a little bit more into the blues. And so that's what we're doing there. So this is our, um, our radial slider here. And if we go under here, we have another one, which is feather. So I'm going to increase the feather a little bit. Because if you go there, it's very hard. So I just want to kind of soften that off. And let's make it bigger. So let's just drag it here. So I'm creating, you know, sort of like a spotlight effect there. Now, once I click away from the tool onto, you know, just any tool here, it goes back out. And now when I make these adjustments, it adjusts everything together. But notice that it maintains that spotlight effect. So I might go here and I might warm it up just a little bit. So now that's kind of neutralizing the rest of the color, but it's warming up a little bit in there. And let me just uh, click away from there again. And we can see we've made our initial adjustment. And now we've got the highlight on that king and we're focusing on the area we want. So, you know, if you feel like, you know what, I wish it was a little softer, we can go back here, click on there. Notice that that pin, you just select the pin and we can adjust it again. So let's increase that feather more. There we go. And let's click away. Yeah, see, that's looking softer now. So you've got to watch out that those edges are not too noticeable. If those, those edges become noticeable, 
then it looks fake. All right, so what do we got here? Um, thanks, Rich. Uh, what do we got? Any questions? Can we do this in Photoshop with the light effect? Yeah, you could. You could, but the nice thing about doing it inside of Camera Raw here, or actually inside of Lightroom, is that it's non-destructive. That means you can go back and change it. And I'll show you how we can go in here and do that in Photoshop. So we're going to right click now and I want to open this in Photoshop. So we're going to choose edit in, but rather than choosing edit in Photoshop, we're going to go down to open as a smart object in Photoshop. And now this is going to bring it into Photoshop as a smart object. There it is. And if we double click this smart object, it takes us into camera raw. And then we've got our same tools up here. And if we click here, there's our oval tool or our radial tool. And you, there's our pen. We can click on that pen and look at this. We can adjust it more. So to answer your question of why we didn't use the light effect inside of Photoshop, which you could, I would do it this way. Or, you know, you could just go into Camera Raw here and do exactly the same thing we did in Lightroom. Or you can start in Lightroom, go into Photoshop, and now you still have this flexibility to go back in and edit this again inside of Camera Raw by double clicking it because it's a smart object. And now to create that kind of texture around it, it's super easy. All I did is I just overlaid a texture. So I went into Adobe Stock and I got some different things in Adobe Stock. Here's a lot of the images. This is my library, by the way. And I create a textures one. So these are the different textures that I've got from Adobe Stock over the years. And a couple I might have created myself. And you can just kind of add those into the library as well. And if you want to use these textures, it's as simple as taking the texture and just dragging it out over the photo. Let's take it to that corner there. And I'm just going to drag it out. Notice it's scaling proportionally. If I want to scale non-proportionally, I hold down the shift key. And now I can drag it like that, which is the opposite of what it used to be. Inside of Photoshop, it used to be non-proportional, and you held down the shift key to constrain it. So now it's the opposite. And if you don't like that change, by the way, you can change it yourself. So if I hit Control T or Command T for free transform, and we go up here, see this? link if i unlink this now this is non-constrained and i hold down the shift key to constrain it if i turn that link on now it's constrained and the shift key to non-constrain it so if you want to put it back to how it used to be in photoshop just turn that chain link off while you're inside of free transform and it'll remember that option so i'm just going to hit enter and uh and there we go and somebody was asking there, um, of course, if you do have any requests, please drop them in there. Um, we may not cover them today, but they're definitely going to give me ideas for tutorials. For example, this week's tutorial um, on masking edges was because of, uh, was it Richard? Um, just say hi there. I know you're, you're in here right now. Um, but it was because of his request is why we did the uh, we did that tutorial. So... Um, so when because I did notice somebody said something here about a tutorial on smart objects. Um, I have a tutorial on the Photoshop Cafe channel on YouTube and also on PhotoshopCafe.com. Um, and by the way, I don't know if you guys realize this, but when I do a video on YouTube, a lot of the time I'll embed that at the website at PhotoshopCafe.com and I'll also add written instructions. So if you're a YouTube follower and you see something and you wish there was written instructions, go to Photoshop Cafe and you'll find that tutorial there. And most of the time you'll find those written instructions. Um, and of course, if you're on Photoshop Cafe, you can obviously just watch it right there on the website. Yep, there we go. David, thank you. David Holstock. It was his idea for the tutorial I did uh, this Tuesday. So anyway, yes, yeah, so I do have one on smart objects um, where I actually use potatoes to uh, demonstrate smart objects. And uh, may maybe we'll add that to the to the live stream. Uh, we won't do it today because it's going to be a little involved, but maybe we can do it uh, in, a, in a future one. So, OK, we've got this texture here. Let's go ahead now with this texture and 
Obviously, it's hiding everything. I'm just going to hide my library right now. So all we want to do is just change the layer of blending mode. So where it says normal, just click on here. And one of the things they added, as a lot of you probably already know, I would say most of you know, but not everybody, um, they made a change here now where as you scroll over here, we can now get a preview. And that was added in, I believe, CC 2019. Such a nice change. So we can just roll over here and we can say, okay, which blend mode works the best? And by the way, if you go on Photoshop Cafe and do a search, I have a very in-depth tutorial on there on blending modes where I explain every single blending mode and, and what it does. But when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, you know, we've got this one here, which hides white. So we're under normal. Then we've got the darken. So these are the darken group. All of these hide white. Then we've got the lighten group. All of these hide black. And obviously they work different ways. And then overlay hides 50% gray and works differently. Then we have these utilitarian ones. These ones kind of are useful um, for aligning things. So if you have layers and you want to align them different, these uh, modes work very well for that. So they're kind of utilitarian. And then we've got this one, Hue, which obviously hides the color. Saturation, so we can uh, Hue, Saturation, Color, Luminosity. So these are ways, like for example, if I go into color blend mode and I'm painting with a color, that way I can add that color without changing the luminosity. If I go under luminosity, I can change the texture without altering the color. And then hue and saturation work on a particular color or how much color is there. But anyway, all of that aside, let's go down here, maybe do a multiply blend mode. And we can pull the opacity back a little bit. Let's pull this back. So we're just kind of dropping it in a little bit, adding a little texture. So now it's starting to look a little bit more grungy and a little bit more weathered. So we're not using those... Uh, brand new playing cards which you know just don't really work for that particular um, look I was going for now if I had old worn cards they would have been better but I don't so I just shot what I had all right so then we could grab something here like this leather texture is kind of nice too so we can stack textures on top of each other so I'm going to drag this one up into the corner and I'm going to get it to fit and then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go into blending modes here and we can see what looks good. I'm kind of liking hmm, color burn or multiply. Either of these are working quite well. Color burn obviously is very heavy, but once I drop the opacity down a little bit, we can see it's going to look a little different. So we can say, hey, how do you like that? Or do you prefer multiply? What, do you, what one do you guys like? Is darken, multiply? Color burn, linear burn, darken. Do you guys have one that you like? Drop it in the comments and let me know which one that you like the best. And uh, maybe we'll choose that. I'm kind of liking maybe multiply myself or color burn. Kind of torn there. Um, so why don't you tell me what you guys would want to use? And uh, of course the delay in the comments there. Let's see where we're at. And I will set one of those. For now, we're going to go. We, oh, here we go. Here we go. Color burn. All right. So we've got one vote from Suzanne for the color burn. And uh, multiply. All right. So we have a multiply vote. So we like multiply there. Or color burn. All right, so, so far we are two votes for Multiply and one for Color Burn. All right, so we'll go with the, uh, why don't we go with the Multiply then, since the uh, the votes are having it. And so if this feels like, you know, hey, this is good, but it's just a little too much, what we can do is create a, sorry, not a layer, we're going to create a layer mask. Select the layer, click on the new layer mask. And then what I could do is I could, you know just create an ellipse or something in here and I could go in and make this shape here and I want to reduce the amount there now the thing is if I fill this mask with black it's going to completely hide it um, so we hit alt option and that's going to completely hide it and um, yes John 
textures do come with Photoshop, and I'll show you exactly where they are in a second. Um, so rather than filling it with black, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to fill it with gray. And you can see it's 43% gray if you care. That's that B box once again, that brightness. It's very useful. If you don't use it, um, start using it. Um, it's a very useful reference. Okay, so I'm going to hit the Alt Delete, and that would be well, actually Option Delete, which would be Alt Backspace on Windows, and that fills that mask with gray. Control D to turn it off. So what I'm doing is I'm reducing the amount of that texture in the middle without completely getting rid of it. If I use black, it would have just got rid of it. So I just want to have a little bit of it there, but stronger towards the edges. So I want to have less texture in the middle, more texture on the edges. Okay, so obviously there's a line there. It's very obvious that I've done that, but we can easily just go under the properties panel here, and we're just going to take the feather, and we're going to feather the edge of that, and notice as we do that, it just blends it in. So now we've got a smooth blend there, and we're adding that texture. Let me show you that texture by itself. So I'm going to hide the other one so you can just kind of see it there. And so if we show you before and after, you can see see that texture. It's much easier to see when I go before, after. And you can see now it's kind of less in the middle, more on the edges. And... Uh, and then we can blend this other texture and maybe reduce this other texture a little bit. So I'm going to go up under the opacity and maybe just bring that down slightly. And essentially that's what I'm doing there to add those textures is just start to stack the textures on top of each other and use different layer blending modes and different masks and you can start to sculpt those textures and get some really cool looks. Um, let me just check here is any questions. Um, in general, use of blend modes. I love soft light for lots of things. In this case, multiplies gray with lower opacity. Yeah, um, and soft light is also a great uh, blending mode. I like to use that a lot when I'm actually working on portraits and stuff. All right, so what we can do here is I'm going to answer that question about where the textures are for John here. Um, <laughs> Susan, I, I wish I had an answer for every problem. Um, if I don't know something, I will tell you I don't know it, and I'll find out for you. So let me go here, and what I'm going to do is show you where the texture is. So if you go under Window, and by the way, are you on Photoshop 2020, John, or are you on an earlier version of Photoshop? Please let me know. Um, because under Photoshop 2020, there was a big, big change that happened inside of Photoshop. And that's when these were actually put into a panel. And these are called patterns inside of Photoshop. And so we have a patterns panel. And if we look at this panel here, it comes with different textures. And of course, I've loaded in the legacy ones. These all come with Photoshop, by the way. If you click under here, um, you can see you click on legacy patterns and more. And so if those are missing, you just see trees, grass, and water. Click on that, and all of these other ones will appear. And if we look in here, we've got rust, gravel, wood, stone, dirt. We've got all these different textures, which are just wonderful. So you don't necessarily have to use the, um, you know, the Adobe stock ones. If you can find what you've got, you know, there's papers. There's all kinds of things in here. Look at this. So, you know, if I wanted to use one of these, I could just simply... Let's go back under, I kind of like these rust ones. Let me grab that rust one, click and drag. Notice it just appeared in there with that pattern fill. It's got that mask. Let me hide the other two so I can show you what it does. Before, well, let me hide these. Ah, it's clipping to that one underneath. Okay, so there's before. Ah, let me hit the ultra option key so I'm not clipping that. There we go. All right, so that's showing it right there. So that's the texture. And, um, by the way, I just have the Alt or the Option key for that arrow, and I can click there, that clips, and then that one releases it from a clipping group. All right, so if we go into here, we can change our blend modes, and, uh, you know, you could go in there and obviously just use this very, very faintly. Now, there's other things we can do with it, of course. If we double-click on it, we get our pattern fill comes up, and this is where we can change the scale. So we could just make it a much bigger pattern there, see that? Or we can go here and make it smaller, which just means it's going to repeat a lot. 
Um, so that's how you can control those patterns. So those patterns are there inside of that panel inside of Photoshop 2020. Before Photoshop 2020, this is how you would do it. And of course, you can still do it in Photoshop 2020. Just go down here, create an effects adjustment layer. And then we're going to go up under here. Uh, I'm sorry, not just we're going to go up under here. There we go. So we're not doing a layer style. We're doing an adjustment. And then under the adjustment, you have one called pattern. And we click on the pattern. And lo and behold, the same patterns are here. And we can go in there. We can find the patterns. It's a little harder to work, which is why they added that panel. Because you can see what it looked like before the panel. And I could grab something like that dirt texture there. Go in there. I can adjust the scale of it. Click OK. Try blend mode. You know, all kinds of maybe something like overlay might work for this one. Drop the opacity down and you can see how you can start to work with patterns and textures that way as well. So hopefully you guys are finding that useful. And um, so anyone got any questions? So it looks like we are ready for questions. Um, drop them in there right now. And we're going to be just kind of wrapping up. Those are the tutorials, but I'll be happy to do Q&A. And I uh, hope you guys are enjoying these. Um, if you want to see more of these, let me know as well in those comments there. And also do me a favor. When this goes live on YouTube, which it will very soon, um, could you, if you don't mind, hitting the like button? Because this is really going to help spread the word. And, uh, you know, because I'd really like to build a little bit of a community on here when we do these live streams. And um, in fact, I think you can hit the, the like button right now on your browser and it should add that in there. That would be really appreciated. Um, it's just the way the algorithm works in YouTube. And then what that does is it just, it, it, it will allow more people to see it. And, uh, you know, while we're going through this lockdown period, I'd like to do these weekly um, live streams. And then we can, you know, just have our little community here. We can kind of come together so we're not going stir crazy because um, I know some of us, you know, some of us might be with family, some of us might be alone, uh, some of us might be with pets, some of us might be, you know, with kids. Um, we're all in different situations here, so it's just nice that we can have this little bit of uh, time when we can kind of come together. And thanks, guys, for those of you who pushed that like button. I really appreciate it. And definitely going to tell your friends, thank you. Yeah, share this with your friends. So what we're going to do for now is we're going to come together every Thursday at 1 o'clock. Now, this is not something we're going to do indefinitely. Um, it's just something we're going to do for a little while, just while we're in lockdown so we don't feel so alone, so we can, you know, just kind of come together and, um, you know, have a little bit of uh, Photoshop, uh, little Photoshop goodness. Um, so uh, let's have a look. And thank you, Ashton, you know, my personal... He enjoys my personal contact online. I'm trying my best. Um, you know, I know I don't have the uh, biggest personality, you know, online like some people do. But, uh, you know, hopefully I can share my knowledge with you and uh, we can kind of come together. Uh, what do we got here? Oh, any questions? I don't, I'm not seeing any questions right now. So... Oh, by the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, I've got to start that out there, right? <laughs> if you guys haven't subscribed to that Photoshop Cafe channel, make sure you do, you know, hit the subscribe button um, because that is going to uh, give you those notifications when I do these live streams. It'll actually give you a little red dot will appear on your YouTube when we're going live. But in order to do that, you also need to turn on the notifications. So if you have subscribed, right next to it, there's a bell. Click on that bell. And then uh, set that to the option that gives you all notifications. And then you will also uh, know when I when I do these live, it'll show you that little notification. And also it might send you an email with those notifications. Plus I'll do my best to um, keep letting you guys know in a newsletter. Um, I almost feel like maybe I should start a, a group, uh, not a group, but a uh, an option on the newsletter just for the people that are interested in these live streams. So I don't send it out to everyone in the newsletter. I just send it to the people that care about these. But anyway, Cafe Crew, guys, thanks. Thanks for your support. Thank you for your support over the years. Um, it's been 20 years, believe it or not. It's our 20th year doing Photoshop Cafe. And uh, I really appreciate 
you guys. I'm, I'm, I know there's a lot of people being with us since the very beginning. And, uh, and you know, we're family. So, and for our newer people here on YouTube, I say newer because, you know, I haven't been doing YouTube as long as I have. And uh, I've been on YouTube for about 10 years, but only been doing it seriously for the last, you know, couple of years, few years now, three years maybe. And so you are also part of the cafe crew. You're part of the community as well. Um, so make sure all of you are on a newsletter on Photoshop Cafe and also subscribe to the YouTube channel so that uh, I can keep in touch with everybody. All right, so it's been an hour. And put your votes in there in those comments. If you prefer an hour, say an hour. If you prefer 30 minutes, say 30 minutes. And next week, I guess we'll get together again. So until then, guys, thanks for coming. And I will see you at the cafe.